Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back from the break. Uh, and excited to uh, run this track for you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, so stage two. This is the um, uh, the track that we get to follow up and uh, uh, specialize on fintechs and APIs. My name is Claire Barrett. I'm a director at APIs First. And delighted to get to introduce a fantastic lineup for you. You can put questions for uh, our, our speakers on the online chat. Um, we've got Katrine Van Yezel coming up to talk about opening up the vault at KBC. Uh, we have Monica Likawa. She's going to be talking about how her team at Enfuse is making an environmental impact from payments APIs. But first up, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Salmoni who's going to open our eyes to some of the unexpected innovations that he's seeing in the world of open banking. Michael, welcome, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Claire, for the introduction. And um, indeed, I'd like to take you through some of the things we're seeing on open banking, open finance, and beyond. Uh, Equins Worldline is uh, Europe's largest payments provider. So we're, of course, very excited about all banks now having APIs on top of them that one can access the data. And uh, there's uh, quite some debate how quickly open banking is going. So uh, indeed, in Europe, maybe some things are still stuttering a little bit. But it's very clear that this is going to conquer the world, is already conquering the world. Uh, we already see thousands of uh, fintechs. We, some individual banks have already uh, uh, grown gardens of their own. Thousands of fintechs. We get billions of venture capital money going in there. The UK especially has been operational for a while. And uh, we are working with people all across the world, in Japan, in Asia, in Africa, in America, in Canada. Uh, everywhere, uh, open banking is happening. And um, this is a lovely trend. And initially, the banks were a little bit reticent whether the, why they had to open up their crown jewels of the, of the data. But more and more are now seeing it as actually as an opportunity. And some of them, uh, the top left chart, if you can see it, is uh, they're actually going aggressively into this. So the idea where they see this just as an annoying compliance topic uh, are over. And more and more banks, in fact, the majority now, are seeing this as an opportunity. What is this going to actually mean for banks and for, for customers? I'll take you through this very quickly because you are all API experts and fintech experts. But just to give some of the examples uh, that, that we're seeing. Um, well, this is, for example, what the statement will look like, uh, looks like now. Uh, you, I don't know, your bank may be different, but my bank uh, dumps a whole lot of hexadecimal codes on me. And I have really no idea what, what I sent the one pound to or the one euro to and what purpose it was. Uh, my credit card in the UK actually goes a different direction. It only shows you shows me the total. And I have no idea who it is for and, and what it is for. So this is clearly not a customer interface that, uh, that uh, people want. And that is an opportunity for fintechs. And that's why we're going to get these PFMs, which integrate the data from all the banks, so that I can see from my, uh, uh, my German bank with all its hexadecimal codes, my British bank with just the, the top line, my credit card statements and all the other things, it's going to integrate them in a nice, beautiful way for me to look at in a graphical way so I can see how much I'm spending on shopping, how much on insurance, how much I'm, uh, my net available income is, all these things that are really of interest to the user, which the, the banks are not always, always providing. So this is obviously the, the first step of what is happening, is that we get a nice overview over all our funds. And some people say, see, that is already the, the end goal, that I can see my net worth. Uh, but of course, the thing that is really driving this is not just this account aggregation, it is the data behind it. And all these data that are now being unlocked on my statement, which tells me how much I earn, what I'm insured for, what magazines I subscribe to, is launching these thousands of fintechs. And that's as you as API people are surely aware. But of course, uh, this data can't be unleashed just uh, as is. It needs to be protected. And uh, here is an example. I have uh, recently did a genetics test, uh, not necessarily related to COVID, but you basically spit in a test tube and you send it to a lab in America. And this uh, lab called 23andMe will analyze your genes and will tell you what your probability are of getting cancer, whether you're going to go bald, 
uh, whether what your earwax is like, whether your hair is going to be curly, uh, all these things. They're not always entirely accurate, uh, but it is um, really interesting data. And for example, I, I am actually 2.5% Neanderthal. So my ancestors had a bit of cross species hanky panky. So all these things are is maybe a little bit entertaining, but they are also, of course, incredibly valuable. If my insurance were to know what my risk of getting cancer are and what, I, what my malaria deficiency are when I travel to Africa, that might be very relevant for them. So that's why, of course, this protection of data is of absolute of, of the essence. And that's why these things like the two-factor authentication have been, uh, have been done. Uh, so once one has uh, ensured that data is only released subject to user consent, one can be begin to do things that are really interesting. And here's an example from, uh, from an insurance uh, case, where again, what you see on your statement is lots of um, digits which nobody has any idea about. But this FinTech, for example, has developed 4,000 rules of how to interpret that. So they can see, oh, he has a dog, he's paying a dog insurance, he has a house, he's paying a house insurance, and he's got a fire insurance. And therefore, that gives them hooks to allow you to, to, do, uh, to get help, whether I'm properly insured, whether I'm doubly insured in some cases, maybe, or underinsured somewhere else, and uh, maybe I, whether I can get a better offer uh, elsewhere. So this is a very simple example of how data on my transactions seen on my bank can help me get better insured, me maybe reduce my insurance premiums, and for innovative insurers and innovative banks uh, to, to, to develop new business. I mentioned that I live in Germany, and uh, some people think Germany is very advanced, but actually the way we pay bills here is on the right, which shows that my wife kindly fills in these forms with IBAN codes and reference codes every weekend so that we can pay the kindergarten and, uh, and the various other things. And of course, this can be done in a much more modern way where it pops up in your phone and says, yes, I do want to pay that doctor's bill and finished. Um, the more business uh, relevant one for banks, especially, of course, is credit and loans. And there are companies that have, uh, that have emerged since the beginning of, uh, of APIs and open banking who say, we're going to be able to do credit much quicker. Because instead of these paper-based processes and asking Experian for a red, yellow, green indicator, we can actually see how much uh, credit this guy can afford. What is his disposable income? and uh, what are his outgoings and how do they vary over time. And they can even monitor the loan after it has been issued. So once it has been, been issued, they can see, oh, he stopped paying his charity payments. Maybe that's a signal we should have a closer look at him to see whether he can really afford that loan still. So this is where uh, credit is being uh, um, severely disrupted. And for the user, this, uh, this looks like, uh, this is, for example, an example called Prosper where it basically goes through all your accounts, see all your loans that you currently have uh, on your credit cards or with, with a bank or with others, and you just push an optimize button and it shows you if you consolidate your loans, you will get much better deal. So I don't have to explain all the consequences for banks here, but this of course is massively disruptive for, for banks and uh, credit cards and, and various other parts of the business. I will continue going at a high rate because I know you are all experts. So the, the, these examples have all been consumer examples. But, uh, and, and indeed, if you read the regulations of most countries, they're always concerned about consumer choice and competition. But actually, the money, of course, is in B2B. And that is why uh, a number of fintechs, in fact, according to some of the surveys we've done, uh, most of the fintechs are now actually focusing on B2B. And that, for some, is quite a surprising finding. Most people are looking only at the consumer side and not looking at the B2B. And since there's been repetitive surveys that maybe the corporates, especially SMEs, which are 80% of the market, are not being served well enough by, by traditional uh, providers, this is a huge opportunity for fintechs to get in exactly where the money is and provide much better services. So all these uh, little examples I've just brought up uh, uh, aim to show a wider trend. Namely, uh, it is the uh, open innovation. This is something we already saw on the iPhone. The iPhone initially was designed only to be a phone and have a few services that Apple would provide. And then they opened the App Store and invited third parties to come up with creative solutions of what to do on the iPhone. Initially, the thought was, oh, they're just going to do some telecom services like managing your bill or, uh, or changing your, your provider contract. 
But of course, we know now that there are hundreds of thousands of different applications, Candy Crush and Tinder and Skype and, and Google Translate and Wikipedia that have appeared. One puts rocket fuel on this uh, phone by opening it up to third parties. And this is exactly what we're going to see now in banking. Banks previously were the secure environment and, uh, and developed all their applications themselves. The mobile banking app came from your bank, the internet banking service came from your bank, and now this is being opened up to third parties, and we again are going to get the rocket fuel of innovation coming through third parties who are coming up with the most amazing things of what you can do on top of a bank, on top of the bank data. So that is already the story of open banking, but that it doesn't stop there. We uh, started with just putting a few APIs on top of a bank. That was basically PSD2 in Europe. And now we're going into open banking, where we unleash the third parties. So basically put apps on top of banking, put an app store on top of a bank, which multiplies the usefulness of a bank and the, and the innovation uh, considerably. And the next stage is the open API mashup economy. I'm sorry, I don't have a better name for it. Some people call it OpenX, but I think that's actually describes it. That means that the APIs of all industries are now going to be mashed up. And this is going to lead to some interesting things. Some of the stuff that we're seeing now already is some people from the health area who are coming up with smoking applications to help you stop smoking and give you benefits in financial and other terms. Um, you, you can benchmark yourself better. You can uh, do identity better. You only pay for what you use in your hotel. There's a horoscope company which approached us which just wanted your date of birth in a reliable way. Uh, using open banking. So we're getting all sorts of things which I don't think people initially envisaged when they started uh, PSD2. And I only want to drill down in one of them, and that is the dating scientist, because that recently won a hackathon we were involved in. And the idea there is, um, as you will know, uh, people nowadays meet online. Uh, in, uh, when I was uh, a, young, a young man, we used to meet in bars or through relatives or at uh, work or at university. That's, that's how you met your partner. But of course, the online dating curve has gone rapidly uh, upwards and people meet online. But of course, people lie all the time. They say what they're interested in, what they look like, how much they earn, whether they have a yacht or how big a car they have. And uh, the uh, people who entered this uh, hackathon, this was actually an online dating site, uh, who obviously know a lot about this, said there might be a market for people to be honest to each other. If I reveal a little bit more what kind of sort of income category I am, whether I do have a car, how often I go on holiday, what magazines I subscribe to, whether I am a Greenpeace member, all things are verifiable on your account, then maybe somebody else will also be honest and you can get a real match between real people with real data and real honesty. And we'll see how this develops, but that to me was, for example, a surprising application of open banking, which I don't think the regulators thought of when they formulated PSD2. And there are gonna be many more. I don't have the time to go into all of them now, but one of them, of course, will be identity. Identity is an absolute mess at the moment. You just click on a yes, no to either buy some alcohol or go into a, a dubious websites. And uh, even my Scrabble app asked me for my age for some reason. So uh, verifying your identity and your age and whether you've got a TV license uh, is you see that all the time and it's just clicking a button, which of course is ridiculous and it's actually illegal. And some people have come up with creative ideas how to solve that. One of them was the UK government who said you need to register at the post office if you want to access pornographic websites. So there will be a central uh, website to see who is interested in that kind of material. And that, of course, didn't go down well in the press. You can see that on the bottom left. So that's maybe not the way to do it, put up a central government website. But instead, one can use open banking because there are APIs which allow you to do, verify whether you're over 18, whether you have paid your BBC TV license, what your age is, etc. That is, of course, the modern way of doing it. So uh, this will change uh, also the topic of identity. So I won't go through all the different application areas, but one thing has been coming increasingly clear is that smart banks will have to, and indeed are, opening up their assets using APIs. So they won't just do the PSD2 thing where there's one API for accessing data and one for initiating payment. They're going to have lots and lots of different APIs. For example, uh, doing different payment APIs, not just the standard one. For example, Netflix would like to pay every month, would like to be paid every month, and only after the 30 days grace period has expired. That's a very special payment API. And there's many more subscription APIs like that. 
But it's not only those, it's also the lending APIs, which I think are absolutely key. Banks are increasingly trying to get into bicycle rental platforms, car rental platforms, Airbnb. These all uh, might need some financing, shopping uh, platforms. So lending APIs, if a bank wants to show up in the digital world, they're going to have to put their APIs on these digital merchants. And then there are the B2B services there that I mentioned, and also the identity that I mentioned. All these things are clearly being opened up. So there's going to be a wealth of APIs that are now being opened up and offered by banks because that puts them in the digital space like they used to have to have a shop in the high street to be in the old space. So what does this uh, API mashup economy that I mentioned uh, earlier mean? Well, uh, this is where we all mash up our data. It's not just using bank data, but it's using data from all industries and combining them to do new things. Uh, so there are APIs now, of course, for your location, for uh, translating a text using Google, for uh, as, uh, the, the data on your IoT device or on your uh, connected car or on your fridge. There's, fr there's flight data from Swoodoo. And this is being combined. And if you look at uh, all the modern services that are being developed, they're already doing exactly that. Uber, for example, takes your location, i.e. the API on your phone, the driver's location, the API on his phone, Google Maps, and a payment. Those four APIs are mashed together to provide Uber service. So this is how Uber is created. You take four APIs and you mash them together. And that is basically the model that I believe is being played now. We are all mashing our data together using APIs, and this is the mashup economy that I was proposing earlier as being the sort of next step which we, which we are now entering into. So what, what, what will this mean if, uh, uh, if, if everybody mashes it up together? Well, I think it's going to be full of surprises, as already open banking is already beginning to be full of surprises. Here's an example of a toaster that you can buy commercially. Uh, online, and that toaster will toast the weather uh, of where you're going uh, today on your toast for breakfast. And it can do that because uh, this toaster accesses uh, the API of the weather service. It accesses the API of your calendar to see where you are. And uh, thereby, together, it allows you to toast the weather of your location onto your breakfast toast. And using open banking and, of course, toast your bank balance if you'd want that or, or other things. So the point I'm trying to make is no one can predict the future. Once you unleash the creativity by opening up the APIs and the data of various providers, not only banks, and mash them up, you're going to get really exciting things happening. And I think that's wonderful that uh, this conference is looking at that. And I basically just want to close and say thank you, thank you for uh, watching me on this. Um, I hope I've made the case that this fintech with all their new ideas and their flexibility and their customer orientation, much better statements, for example, than banks, when they use data, they're going to provide fantastic new opportunities. The banks, they won't disappear. That is ridiculous. They have the data. They have the solidity. They have the finance. They have the customers. And if the banks and the fintechs work together, and indeed all industries work together, also the APIs from the health industry, from the big techs, from transport, from telco, and we all connect them together, then we're going to create this amazing new world. And then we're all going to be the winners, the customers, the B2Bs, the incumbents, the new entrants, and Europe and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. That was a uh, fantastic um, uh, overview of, uh, and I love the introduction of the API, the mashup economy, uh, and uh, 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 an acceleration, you know, a fast track through um, some of the uh, uh, opportunities that are coming out of this next whole level post um, open banking. Um, I, I'm curious, you, you did mention uh, about some of the things that the regulators would not have thought of um, early on that are now becoming. Uh, you know, ideas that are being created around the scenes. What do you think are some of the, the challenges for uh, the financial services types of regulators keeping pace with uh, uh, this type of innovation and challenge? Mm. I mean, first of all, I think it's worth giving a shout out to the regulators. They were actually brave enough to do this, right? I mean, Europe actually came up and said all banks now have to put APIs on top which could be a security risk if not done right. It could be a massive investment, which distracts from other things. 
So I think it's absolutely fantastic that Europe forged ahead and created worldwide. You know, we often complain that Europe is a bit behind the Americans and the Chinese. Here, uh, Europe is ahead and it's been a model for the whole of the world. They haven't got everything right. It is an incredibly complex and large regulation. And there are some things we could talk about where, uh, where maybe a little improvement could, could happen. But one is already seeing, for example, in, with Brexit, although I'm not a fan of Brexit, uh, Brexit allows now the UK to change some of the rules, some of the things that don't work so well, like this 90 day rule and the SCA stuff for the experts. Uh, they can now change them and make it even better. So this will evolve and become even more dominant. I'm sure of it. Yeah, it's um, uh, and you you have the opportunity uh, to talk to a lot of uh, you know boards and executives and 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 leaders in and around this space. What what are some of the conversations that you're having with them to talk about, for example, this mashup economy and mm -hmm. uh, some of the you know opportunities and, and, and challenges for their for their strategies and and directions. Hmm. I mean, it's really interesting because there's a very widespread at the moment is what, what I'm seeing, right? There are some banks who are saying, wow, this is terrific. We've been waiting for this. We want to do the iPhone story. We want to put apps on top of our bank. Everybody's going to come to us because we have the best apps and we have the best applications, just like everybody wants to go to the iPhone. Um, and we don't want to do the Nokia, right? We want to stay behind and only do our own services, right? That, that's one extreme. And there are the other extreme. And some banks are saying, but I don't get paid for each API call. Can't I charge one cent per API call? I'm afraid they haven't quite got it, if I can be plain about that. And uh, the, the new world will, I'm afraid, overtake them. So um, I think it's, uh, so it's very interesting to work with those who are really gung-ho on this, but also to help those who still sort of have a more traditional view and that every little service needs to be paid to see the bigger picture, that this will put them in the center of a new digital economy. And that's, that's going to be fantastic. Mm. No, that's um, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm um, checking. We've had a, we've only had one question so far on the um, access to slides. Uh, I know for for those in the audience, um, all of these presentations are available on demand, uh, usually within a week or so. Oh, we do have a question here from Ibrahim. Um, what do you think needs to change to make standardizations of these APIs and the information that they give easier? For example, accessing data from one bank would be a whole lot harder than from another bank. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's one thing maybe Europe was not, in my view, not strict enough about, right? It, uh, it, we have 4,000 different banks and 4,000 different interpretations of APIs, and that's not ideal. UK, for example, has been much more rigid and said, okay, only this API will, will shall be. And that's made life much easier. But on the other hand, if you have lots of different APIs, it opens up the opportunity for service providers, right? We don't have the same power plug all over the world, but we have an industry that does adapters. And that works OK. It would be ideal to have the same power plug everywhere in the world. But now we haven't got that. Let's solve it with adapters. Let's not scrap everything and try to put one single API in there. I don't think that would make any sense. But maybe we should have done that when we started off. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm um, uh, also got, so, um, we've got an opportunity to have you back here. Uh, you're joining our panel um, at uh, uh, um, 3.15, um, sorry, 5.15 um, Helsinki time uh, when um, we're going to get to meet with you and uh, two others. Oh, we've got, sorry, another question quickly. We do have a minute. Um, Abraham's asked another question about when you said B2B was where the money was. Is there some kind of um, view of what this sort of percentages mean? So uh, mm. yeah, have, you, have you got some feel mm. yet for the size yeah. of this and comparison? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, there, there are plenty of studies which say it's about 80-20, right? The, uh, it's about 80-20 B2B versus B2C. All, and we're always only focusing on B2C instead of looking at the B2B. And I think the real opportunity for open banking is you know, all the big corporates, they've all got their proper solutions. You know, uh, SAP has got their way they're tied to Deutsche Bank or whatever. You know, the big corporates, they, they all have. But there are hundreds and thousands of SMEs everywhere, and they have to send faxes to their bank and negotiate FX rates. And when they do some trade or insurance, it's a nightmare. These could all be digitized. And then you capture a huge part of the market that isn't addressed yet. Uh, we call it the democratization B2B. Right? It's not only for the elite, for the big companies, all the SMEs, which are a large part of the market, 
will now have access to digital services. That's a huge opportunity for SMEs and for, and for the banks. Fantastic. Um, and actually, we're now at time, Michael. So I'm going to have to um, invite the audience to think of other questions because there is a chance to uh, um, follow them up at the panel at the end of this track. And uh, um, thank you very much for your fantastic presentation. And we'll see you shortly. My pleasure. See you later.